Welcome to another episode of Growth Hacker TV. I'm Bronson Taylor, and today I have Paul DeJoe with us. Paul, thanks for coming on the program. No problem. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And uh, you probably notice we're both uh, smiling right now, and the reason for that is because uh, we've actually already done this interview once, and my computer blew up, and Paul was generous enough to come back on and do it again. Uh, so he's that kind of guy. So you should definitely go check out his product because <laughs> he's given us some real time here. But Paul, you're the co-founder and the CEO of Equire. So tell us, what is Equire? Uh, Equire is a interface for your cloud service. So we interface with CRMs and mailing campaigns so that you don't have to tab in and type data twice. We'll do it for you. Okay. And where does it primarily live? Is it a standalone application? Is it inside the browser? Right now, it's a browser extension for Chrome, and it's just a browser extension at this point. Okay. And where do people actually use it at? Like inside of Gmail, inside of LinkedIn? I mean, where does this thing kind of pop up? Uh, it can. It pops up a, a few different places. Our, our biggest, uh, I would say, uh, the largest applications for them for right now are actually in Gmail and in LinkedIn. We also integrate with Hootsuite and Facebook and Twitter and AngelList, Quora. So it will pop up in those places if you want it to. But Gmail and Gmail and LinkedIn are the biggest uh, place for it right now. Okay. So. so you know when you're inside of Twitter, you're inside of Gmail um, or one of those places, and you want to save contact information to somebody or the details uh, to one of your CRMs. You hit a few buttons. It takes that data and it kind of puts it into your uh, place of choice. Is that right? Never more than two buttons. Never more uh, than two so, buttons, all right. So I noticed so, also you guys are really big on like making that whole process frictionless. Is that a big part of what you guys are trying to do here? Yeah, earlier on we, when we really wanted to test if people would actually use this, we tried to make this the, uh, for lack of a better term, sign-up process, not a sign-up process. So how could we actually get you into this and using it and get you to the aha moment as, as quickly as, as we can? So we dropped a sign-up process. We dropped the name password thing and said, let's just do this through the browser and see if we can make it as frictionless as possible and see how people um, interact with the product. And we found that there was actually a way to sustain that and maintain that. So We've created what I feel like is an experience that is almost best in class. You're not used to signing up or trying a new product without entering data or adding your email address and remembering a password. And with Equar, you can use it without actually ever touching the keyboard, which we thought was really cool. Yeah, absolutely. So before you started Equire, were you involved in business development? Um, did you have background that kind of lets you know that there's something here? Yeah, my, my first two startups, I was uh, I was never the founder, but I was on, on the founding team, and I was always in charge of or responsible for getting getting customers in the door, making more revenue, and we had NetSuite, and we had Salesforce, and we tried high rise and a few CRMs, and it got to the point where there was a lot of friction between myself and and the CEO, or uh, mostly because I, I actually, you know, they were they would ask me for reports or where my process is going. And I would say, well, you know, you should hire someone to probably answer this in, in these CRMs because when I'm doing that, I'm not actually making money and look at the revenue. It's growing, it's, mm -hmm. it's working. And so there was like this friction point that was making it mutually exclusive to talk to more people, but get the reporting that, you know, I you know is really important. So I thought I could find a way to get, um, the data to these CRMs without actually requiring mm -hmm. data entry, that there would be a really big opportunity because I knew a lot of people who had the same issues. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that was the background and kind of a personal pain point that was very frustrating. No, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and, and I want to talk about the growth of Equire a little bit because uh, I think this is uh, the really interesting part of your story that I think our audience is going to get a lot from. Now, before Equire was Equire, it was sure. something else. What was it originally called? What was it originally, the idea? Uh, so my, my co-founder, Tal, who is just a really brilliant, awesome guy, he was in a, uh, an incubator in Philadelphia called Dream It. And he had this product called Dropcard, which was under the idea that you should be able to send 
uh, a business card through a, a text message. Mm-hmm. And before the prevalence of smartphones, this was in 2008, he had, he had started that and he had about 11,000 signups that um, were, were happening towards the end of uh, dem- where dem- when Demo Day happened. And that's right when I had met him and started talking to him about what he could do with the product. And um, we kept working together and eventually he asked me to be uh, a co-founder and help out and, and see if we could take the product to a different place. Mm-hmm. And we started looking at the data and we saw that these 11,000 signups were just in fact that they were just signups. There was a lot of people getting excited, mm-hmm. but only, only 30 or so people were actually paying. Uh-huh. And that was my first, um, was my first, uh, I guess, experience in understanding how big the funnel has to be and how much you need to retain from that. So, you know, what we did was we called about a thousand of those people and had an email exchange with, with another thousand, just called them up and asked what was, you know, what was going on, what they didn't like. Mm-hmm. And then we looked at the people that were paying and we found a lot of commonality with the people that were paying were actually in, in business development or business uh, or accounting executive roles. And so when we asked them, uh, the people that weren't using it, why are they not using it or what did they get excited about? Mm-hmm. They kept coming back to this workflow thing, saying the same things like, don't give me another service or another product to log into yeah. that's going to disrupt my workflow. And so we have eventually evolved Dropcard to be this uh, product that was just business cards to tackling a much bigger problem, which was how do we stay in a workflow and be at every exchange or every interaction? Mm-hmm. And get data that's important where it needs to be. And so it, 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 we stopped for a long time. We mm-hmm. had to really, really iterate because if you're going to be that integrated into a workflow, you can't be annoying. You have to be provide the right amount of value for the real that you're going to take. So it took us a while to get the product right, I feel like, and we're, we still have a long way to go. But the drop card of all to what is Equire, which was a much bigger prop, um, I, I think, audience and, mm-hmm. mar- and market size. So. That's Absolutely. kind of the lineage of a completely different uh, product, completely different marketing strategy. But yeah, that, and you went a totally different perfect. direction. But it wasn't just because you decided to; it was based on talking to the customers of the other yeah. product. So let's kind of dive into that a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. Eleven thousand people, and you said you talked to them on the phone, right? Not just email. <laughs> yeah, we we uh, we sat on a, a tall a tall house on his patio, pulled up the Excel spreadsheet, and just started making phone calls and like how many are we talking here? <laughs> uh, it was up near a thousand. Um, yeah. it, it, part of the pro, part of the product had you authenticate with a, with a cell phone number. Mm-hmm. So we actually had their numbers and we spent months doing that. And it, it got to a point where, you know, I think we were stupid enough or crazy enough to probably call everybody. But uh-huh. after, after so many that, that we started hearing the same things from the same same type of people mm-hmm. that it felt like okay we don't need to make any more phone calls we need to actually do this so we called quite a few we emailed a bunch and surprisingly they were very receptive to um, a founder calling or asking them what they thought and what they didn't like mm-hmm. and asking them what they wanted to see or what they would use or what they would pay for I think <clears throat> one thing that's very valuable is to hold people accountable to what their feedback is and say if we were to build this, would you pay nine dollars for it mm-hmm. a month? Um, most of the time, uh, they say that, and they and th- those are their intentions. Sometimes they don't actually do it, mm-hmm. but I think that's a good way to really um, <clears throat> prioritize the feedback and where where your where your resources should go to. Yeah, and when you're making those phone calls, uh, I'm, I'm assuming that wasn't too fun, <laughs> right? No. I mean, what does it feel like when you hear all these customers? I mean, obviously, most of them are not paying for it because only 30 were paying and you called 1,000. So the vast majority of the people you called didn't like you enough to give you money for your product. And you have to ask them why and hear probably negative feedback. So does that just feel like crap or what? (laughs) It's it's pretty brutal. I think think the... um... To to pick up a phone and know that what's on the other end is somebody else telling you why you're an idiot or what... (laughs) A thousand times is uh, it's actually um, it's not fun. Um, yeah. But at the same at the same time, I think you know, one of our, our strengths, I think, as a company is Tall and I have uh, we we make fun of ourselves a lot. We laugh about a lot of mm-hmm. situations, and it was almost like 
we'd be laughing hysterically before I'd pick the phone, call up and say, Hey, what do you, you think Sally's going to call me or dumbass or what? And like, we'd (laughs) make this joke and, and, uh, and so we try to make it fun. And, but at the same time, you, what you have there, um, it actually, your blueprints, the product are going to tell you what they don't like. And you've, you've got to iterate on that. The, The people that like what you're doing, it's good to get back from them messaging and they'll, they'll tell you the things that they do like. And those are the kind of things that you use for messaging on the website or in your marketing material. Yeah. People that don't like to actually give you the blueprint to get better. So Absolutely. I mean, they're giving you a degree in your own product. I mean, they're Correct. teaching you from the it's fundamentals to the you know complicated stuff exactly what they want, why they want it, and the words they use to describe what they want to put in your own copy in your headlines. I mean, yeah. they're giving you this thing on a silver platter. Um, but I think so many startups, they're – they're afraid to do customer development to the extreme mm-hmm. that you have. I mean, they're afraid to talk to 10 people, much less 1,000. Um, and so I think that what you've done right there is a great example of how to get going in a direction that you already know is probably going to work. Um, so that's right. a huge insight from this interview is talk to 1,000 people and suck it up. <laughs> uh, I think one of the a lot of credit went to Tall, too. At one point, we were just asking about our own product. Like, what would you like to see in this, you know, in this card app kind of space and they would talk to us. And then I think tall one day just said, Hey, do you have any other really big problems that you hit that you're just annoying? And then they started like getting into this CRM thing. And so we were serving, we we're talking to the same type of, um, uh, titles at different companies or, or, um, job descriptions. Mm-hmm. And when we started asking that question, it was like this major breakthrough. It was like, you know, all these guys are saying that there was a much bigger problem and, they would all pay a lot more for it, and it's, it seems like it's a huge market size. So I think one thing that you you got to keep in mind is get feedback on your current product, but, but doing that um, it also takes into this uh, consideration that you think you have a product market fit, mm-hmm. and you should also ask what are there some other really big problems that you hate for what you hate or what's a bigger problem that we could help with because yeah. you, you're going to find that you, you, you're serving kind of um, the – the person first. You want to find out about their specific problems. Mm-hmm. Not assume that your current product that they've tried is just a few tweaks away. Try to find out more about their workflow. Try to find out more about what they hate or what they don't like, and you'll find more ways to um, create a bigger opportunity for yourself. You ask them about themselves and other things that they don't like. Yeah, you know, you said a key word there, workflow. One thing I found is, you know, workflows are those things that you just have to do them. Whatever job you're in, there's a workflow, and mm-hmm. everyone's workflow has something that they hate. And if you can find something in a workflow, that means you found something that a business is using. So that means they have money to spend on solutions. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so workflows, I think, are just like this great place for people to look at to develop products and have a, a rabid user base that'll pay a good margin for things. So just you know, one side note there. No, I think that's, that's a great point, and we, and we heard that from these um, really good account executives or business development professionals, these people were great at their jobs and they, mm-hmm. they, viewed, they viewed their workflow as meeting more people, being creative and being problem solvers. That's their preferred workflow. They mm-hmm. go to LinkedIn, they go to Facebook to, to um, prospect. They don't go to their CRM to prospect. And so mm-hmm. they started saying, I'll try anything at least once. If it doesn't disrupt my workflow, it helps me be more productive. And so to find out like, what was actually their preferred workflow. I think that's why we gravitated towards a browser extension. We, we saw that as mm-hmm. the lowest common denominator in workflow. We didn't create something new for you to go to. And it wasn't very innovative on our standpoint. They told us, I want to log into yet another thing. Mm-hmm. You know, they told us that. We tried to figure out, well, how can we create something where they don't have to log into? And we saw yeah. you know, the, how, the how was a browser extension. Now, I think it's really wise how you've done that, which is surprising to me because I've always heard the advice that you can't make money on Chrome extensions, don't do them, go do something else, have your own you know, complicated product that lives in its own world. Um, and I actually believed that until I met you, to be honest. <laughs> I actually thought yeah. like that was good advice. Um, but then the kind of problem you were solving, you needed to be ubiquitous. And sure. your tab in the browser is not ubiquitous. But a browser plugin is ubiquitous as long as they're in Chrome, right? And a lot of people are, and especially a lot of the people that you're interacting with. And so I think it's a great way to kind of solve the pain that you guys needed to solve. Now, let me ask you about um, the numbers now a little bit. So you were at 11,000 and 30. 11,000 signed up, 30 were paying. Yeah. The numbers yeah. have changed quite a bit. You have less that have actually um, signed up, but far mm-hmm. more percentage-wise that are paying. So what do the numbers look like now? 
Sure. So if you go to our, our browser account, I think on our uh, if you go if you try to download eSquire from the Chrome store, it was set, it says right there how many users there are, and I think we're I think just north of thirty four hundred thirty five hundred. Mm-hmm. But the conversion rates are you know I think this morning we just looked up we've got two hundred and eight paying customers, and uh, what's what's great about that is a few of those numbers of that two hundred eight represent. 10 and 20 organizations. Mm-hmm. So you have, uh, you might have one paying customer in that 208, but it represents um, 30 or 40 seats. So we're getting enterprises now actually purchasing for multiple people for the year. Gotcha. And it's a, it's a browser extension yeah. that's, uh, for sales forces, you know, 19 bucks. So I think that um, what, the thing you brought up earlier is not something we you know, here as well in our circle of, of friends and uh, investors, when they hear of things like, well, it's, it's just a browser extension. Mm-hmm. Our customers don't give a shit about what it is. If mm-hmm. it gets the, their data in there and it makes them better. So they don't even know that what's in the background of the technology it just helps them solve a problem. And where our group of people will talk about, well, it's just a browser extension. Yeah. We, we built it to, de-risk and see if, if there was something worth selling on top of or if this is a good way to de-risk it and was mm-hmm. really fast. It turned out to be that we could actually make money off it. So let's see if we could keep um, this process and keep increasing the revenue and, and, and improving the experience without having to create um, you know, a plugin for uh, different platforms and create a website that people had to log into. Mm-hmm. So until we actually see a reason to build a more robust offering that's a lot more involved. We're going to continue to uh, increase the, hopefully increase revenue and, and improve the experience on just the browser. Engine. Yeah. And your, you know, your ratios in the funnel are already so much better. But I think what you said is important because, you know, we get caught up, you know, in the startup world, thinking about things the way startups do, but to the yeah. end consumer, it's just about pain. That's it. That's all they see. That's all they know. That's all they care about. That's the only thing that makes them pull out a credit card. Nothing else really matters at the end of the day. So I think it's a great point that, you know, I may have an opinion on a, on a browser plugin. Who cares? <laughs> it's irrelevant. Yeah, you know, you're not right. solving my pain, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> most, most of our customers have, have no idea what JavaScript is. Most yeah. of our customers have no idea that you know, this is not a, um, uh, a platform or some sort of integration with Gmail. They don't really care. They know that I'm typing an email, and when I'm done, it automatically, gets populated into the places it needs to go and I just saved four and a half minutes. My manager is happier and there's accurate data in Salesforce mm-hmm. or my CRMs that I, that I get back when I need it. That's that's what that's what the technology does and they don't care if it's browser extension, not to mention it. We feel like that we've we've created a really seamless, um, frictionless process to trying out eQuire and, and that seems to um, do well too. So. Yeah, and and right. I'll be the first to tell you, we haven't have we don't have it all figured out. Mm-hmm. Uh, we still have a ton of play, uh, a, you know, a ton of work to do. I think the lesson is actually understand your consumer first. Don't listen to people who are engineers or investors mm-hmm. who are never going to use your product because mm-hmm. yeah, they, they would have easily talked us out of risking with a browser extension. Um, mm-hmm. But we just gave the consumers and listened to them. Yeah. No, that's great. I love that advice. So since, you know, refining your product and kind of finding that product market fit, um, knowing what they really want, what have been your primary customer acquisition strategies? How do people find out about you? How do they know you exist? Um, What do you do to actually get the customers now? So I think they'd fall into three categories. And um, the first one would be that we think the real big pain point is getting data from your your where you're experiencing it to your cloud services. Mm-hmm. So by integrating with these cloud services or working with their APIs, most of them have marketplaces too. So in the high-rise marketplace, in the Salesforce marketplace, in the MailChimp marketplace, and even in Chrome, well, you'll see our um, extension, you'll see eQuire. And that is where we're getting the highest qualified traffic from. So mm-hmm. they're in those places, they have that problem, they download it from those places. So we feel like the more places that we can actually integrate with, um, it, it's almost a marketing decision as much as it is a technology decision because those those web services want more data in, so they help mm-hmm. promote us, they advertise for us as well. So that's one strategy. 
and uh, that you know that's very high quality quality qualified traffic. It's not very high volume. Yeah. Um, our second our second um, method is actually given the nature of the problem that we're we we're trying to solve. If you're using a CRM, you're, you're usually not a one man show. You're you're with a team. Mm-hmm. You're with an organization that has the pain point magnified if uh, it's across a few different people or if you talk to the same person mm-hmm. um, across the company across the company so we have this add your team function where whereby we say you know eQuire gets more valuable with with the more people on your team using it so mm-hmm. what we've done is right after what we call the aha moment which is the first time you experience seeing data go from where it just happened mm-hmm. to your CRM automatically we say isn't that cool don't you want to add your team uh-huh. so we add that there um, and we still have a lot of really cool things we want to do around that. We think that's going to be our biggest driver of new customers, but um, that's the second thing. I think the last thing is we do have a um, – uh, one. I think one of our strong suits is our uh, – Tall's really sharp in marketing, so is Tuan, and I think mm-hmm. we're good at putting content out. We have a blog okay. that gets a lot of uh, traffic and a lot of people that appreciate it. We do marketing stunts. We do um, – we try to keep our content different and unique and funny mm-hmm. and also um, relevant and qualified to the audience. So those are the three main things, and, and they're, they're mostly decided that way because it's a low input, high output um, thing for us. We, we, don't, have a high, for. <laughs> we don't have high uh, customer acquisition costs. I think you know, I get into where I'm trying to sell to a larger enterprise and at this stage of the product, mm-hmm. and it's a... Uh, it's costly just because we we still have a lot of ways to, to go. Mm-hmm. Um, so meeting with the CEO, meeting with the end user, meeting with the manager who's going to make a decision for ultimately a thousand or two thousand seats. Mm-hmm. At, at this stage, I think the product needs to be a bit more a bit more uh, polished and more geared towards an enterprise before we can actually fully delve into adding, you know putting money towards that or putting my efforts towards that. And we yeah. will get to that. But uh, right now, that's on the smaller scale of, of our customer acquisition strategy. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Um, when I was reading your blog, because you mentioned blogging as a part of your strategy, and you're right, I'm reading it, and there's some interesting stuff on there. Uh, one of them was uh, something I think you called the chat hack. Um, yes. It's a way that you reach ideal customers in organizations. Tell us about your chat hack a little bit. Sure. Uh, I think the, a really good thing to, I hope the audience gathers too, is really understand your your most qualified customer mm-hmm. and so what I mean by that is um, if I meet you at a an event or something like that and you say well, what do you do I'm gonna just the first thing I'm gonna say is well do you use Salesforce and Google Apps and if you say yeah or no I'm gonna decide whether you're you're qualified or not our, okay. our biggest the biggest pain point we have or we solve is someone who has Salesforce and Google Apps because they've got to get data to that that CRM or that what have you, and that's where our highest margin customer is. So, the thing, the chat hack came from. I had I had bought a Google uh, a lead list of customers using Google Apps, mm-hmm. large enterprises, and I didn't know if they were using Salesforce or not. So what I would do is I would go to their sites, mm-hmm. and I would if they had Olark or some sort of chat, I would they'd say, "Hey, can I help you today?" And I would say, "Yeah, um, we're thinking about." Um, do you guys have Do you guys have an integration with Salesforce? Does your service integrate with Salesforce? And it could have nothing to do with what they do. Uh-huh. I would just I would just in a few questions, basically ask them. Well, do you guys use Salesforce internally? If you do, I can better explain to you what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh-huh. And they would say they'd say, uh, Oh yeah, we use Salesforce, or no, you know what's Salesforce, or we don't use that. And uh-huh. then like, and then I would understand. Okay, this is a Google Apps customer, and then. And they're using Salesforce, so the next step would be actually pinpointing down who the decision makers and end users would be at that company and mm-hmm. really going after them. And uh, so the chat hack is basically using uh, a company that I'm trying to sell into their uh, their their chat um, their chat uh, solution to find out if they're using Salesforce. So uh, yeah. it was a really really high low input high output thing mm-hmm. for us to try. I like that one so much because when you show up on a website, you know, Ol- Olark or whatever pops up because they want to sell you and then you use the chat dialogue to sell them <laughs> and to get a better qualified lead. So I like that yeah. one a lot. And, you know, yeah. that one specific thing 
you know, other people may not be able to imitate it because our product is different and it just sure. won't work. But it's that kind of creativity that, that you have to be that scrappy, that creative, that ingenious. You have to figure out a way to find where your customer is and how you're going to get access to them because no one is like making it easy for us. No one's saying, hey, yeah. here's all your ideal customers. Just shoot them an email. I'm sure they'll buy. <laughs> like you have to do work to like figure out yeah. where are the leads. So I like that because it shows us how to be creative, how to really get to a good qualified list there. So that's awesome. I think I think a cool thing um, to you know with that point is we we deal with a lot of really amazing, really sharp um, business development professionals, and I think um, most people would say, well, you do you sell to salespeople, and it has this such a negative connotation to it, and it's frustrating because when you deal with someone who's really excellent at biz dev and they're so professional, mm -hmm. they're so they're so creative, and they're just problem solvers and. When you talk to them, they'll say, you know, a great quote we got from Sandy Gibson um, from Get Elevate. He said, I love your product because we're, we're creative, we're not administrative. And, and you talk about, you know, I would not enter the chat hack thing into my CRM. This is what I'm doing because I don't think it's something you can replicate. Mm -hmm. But um, we tried to create the product that allowed them to get the use, get the um, quality or get the, um, the um, value of a CRM without having a ton of input. So we try to keep it very mm -hmm. um, low to touch, high level. So you have guys like Sandy who appreciate our product. And I think that comes from really just trying to understand them and really being humble about us, not knowing anything, mm -hmm. understand, understanding who these people really are and what are they going to use and what are they not going to use. So, um, sorry, I got off on a tangent, but I, no, I think it's... No, it's good. Tangents are good. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I think we went into this not really knowing anything and just listening to people. Mm -hmm. And when you start start to to try to look at what current and natural workflows are, you have people like Sandy or or other really creative business to development professionals. You can see how they don't want to spend time in their CRM because mm -hmm. they get i they get ideas that are different and unique and creative, and they want to act on them. Mm -hmm. And we want to actually allow them to do that more. So yeah. it, it was more to that. So. No, that's great. Um, now something else that I came across in your blog that I was really interested in is uh, your thoughts on perfect price discrimination. Um, maybe first explain to our audience what it is. Uh, we don't mean discrimination in a negative sense here. So explain what perfect price discrimination is and then tell us how you guys are kind of uniquely uh, situated to take full advantage of this opportunity. <laughs> Uh, sure. So I, I think in my, my first startup, we actually had a, we were dealing with a lot of unbanked customers and we didn't want to, it was in transportation and we didn't want to charge an underbanked or unbanked customer as much as, um, someone who had, you know, a hundred thousand dollars in discretionary income each year. Mm -hmm. So we started, I started researching and, you know, this, this theory and, and I'm in such an economics nerd and, looked at this this idea called perfect price discrimination which basically allows you to charge a person based on you know their what they're going to tolerate and not necessarily create one price and make everybody across the board pay for it so in a in an example you'd have a situation where let's say a barber had perfect information on what your preference is for a haircut and what my preference is for a haircut now I think your hair looks a lot nicer than mine, which means that you probably would pay, uh, pay like thirty dollars for a haircut, mm -hmm. where I'm only going to pay max fifteen. So a barber that knows that information will charge thirty to you, fifteen to me. But what you have now is a barber who's charging twenty. So what he's going to do is charge twenty across the board. He's going to lose the fifteen dollars from me, mm -hmm. and he's going to lose the ten dollars in in margin he could have got from you. So with perfect price discrimination, you can actually have a barber that makes $25 more than he currently is in that situation. With us, what we found was that because our product solves a pain point that cloud services have, we actually can identify what type of co company you are and what your um, price palette is, mm -hmm. if you will, based on the services you're using. So okay. we act our, our pricing actually comes from depending on what services you use. So if you're using a high-rise Google Apps, uh, I'm sorry, Google Docs, Mailchimp, Stride, you're you're buying a you're probably a, a younger company and looking for deals on things where mm -hmm. we can charge we charge nine bucks for those integrations. Whereas if you're at a Salesforce 
Um, you're probably not making the decision about buying Salesforce for an enterprise, mm-hmm. and we charge nineteen dollars uh, for that. And granted, we do do a lot more work for for Salesforce, but what you have is a com- a customer who comes in and says, "I use these services," and then we kind of know the optimal price point that we can charge to get um, the, that. We're not dis- we're not um, dissuading any of the companies that are using like a Mailchimp or a free service, and we're not losing money on. Um, charging too less of a price for a Salesforce, which requires a lot more work and support from us. So mm-hmm. it was a it was a way to actually get the highest margin without iterating on a product or creating new technologies, iterating around pricing. Yeah, no, that's great. And hopefully, the people watching this can really think about their own pricing structure right now. And maybe there's a way to get better. You know, it may not be perfect, but maybe better price discrimination. Is there a way to qualify your users based on their price palette? So that you can, you know, optimize what you're charging them because I think it's a really good insight. Um, you've also uh, written publicly that you don't want to start using any paid acquisition for Equire um, mm-hmm. until you have 30% retention. So first, kind of tell us uh, what do you mean by 30% retention because everybody kind of, you know, they, mm-hmm. they calculate these numbers differently. And then why is that? Why don't you just want to do paid acquisition on day one and see what happens? Uh, sure. So... Like you said, um, retention for any product is going to be completely different. I would I would first start by saying, you know, what what is your aha moment with the product? What is that experience where someone um, experiences that aha moment? Do they do that again in a certain period of time, or do they do that for a length of the time? So first, we had to start with identifying what's what's the aha moment that people are using us or paying us for, and we think that's when. You send data or see that data in your CRM that previously would have taken you three or four minutes to enter. Mm-hmm. So, if someone uses Equire to move data to the CRM, we call that our aha moment. If they if they try it one time or they see it one time and they do it again next month, mm-hmm. we've considered them as being retained. So, okay. if they use it for four weeks and on the fourth week they you know they use it again, then we we would consider that having retained that customer. At this stage of the company, yeah. and I think thirty percent is 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 pretty high. But when you talk about a qualified audience that actually sees it, that happening, um, we we wanted to create a, a culture that really really put a lot of emphasis on just keep improving, keep improving, keep improving the product mm-hmm. to where we we could shoot for that thirty percent. And when we talk about as it relates to the paid acquisition, I think. Until you get to that actual target retention number, and you're based on your industry and your product, it's going to be way different. Two percent might be great for your, for your product. Mm-hmm. Once until you get to that actual target retention rate, I think you get in a situation where you'll you're, you'll start labeling some paid campaigns as being failures. Mm-hmm. When really, what was happening was the the product wasn't just just wasn't good enough. It, the the uh. campaign or the channel. Actually, might actually might work, mm-hmm. but you're labeling it as not working because your product wasn't good enough. And what further compounds that problem is that if your customer acquisition cost is too high, it will just it will absolutely shave months off your off your company. You'll you'll get into a situation where you're just paying way too much for um, customers that you weren't able to capture yet. Um, yeah, even if it's the perfect channel. So we we do do a lot of. We did some paid, and we'll still continue to do paid. Where you need to get into a point where you still need a high data set to okay. test new products or new features, uh-huh. and you need to have more people coming in the funnel. And sometimes you just do actually have to pay for some placement to get a new set of uh, uh, data users or cohorts in the in the top of the funnel to try the new experience and see if there's improvements. Yeah. But that's just for. Um, as we talked about yesterday, <laughs> yeah. I thought you brought up a great point, which was that you you can segment that by paying for data, mm-hmm. not actually paying for the customers. I thought that was really insightful. So yeah, we do actually pay for some placements to get new data in the funnel, mm-hmm. but paid ac- customer acquisition I think should ha- happen way later, right until uh, you know after you get retention figured out. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense, and it just helps people to understand when they realize what phase of the company they're in. They don't try to take someone else's tactic and apply it to themselves. You know, if That's you're right. in the growth stage and the product is already perfectly fit to the market, then you can throw money at paid advertising. And as long as the you know the lifetime value of the customer is higher, 
than the customer acquisition cost, then you just mm-hmm. keep doing that. Um, but if you try to do that game too early, then like you said, you think there's a failed channel when really it was a failed product. So early on, pay for data. Later, pay for customers. But just know what you're doing so you have the right kind of um, the, the right uh, you know knowledge from it when you're done. So yeah, absolutely, it makes a lot of sense. Um, That's right. Now let me ask you about this too. You teach a class on startup plays about how to get your first 1,000 customers. Uh, Mm -hmm. I'm sure some of it you probably have already mentioned in here. Um, But what are the highlights of that class? You know, if you were getting with a new startup today and they're like, hey, tell me, Paul, how do I get my first 1,000 customers? Mm -hmm. What are the the highlights? What are the main points? Um, So I think think, um, a lot of times in figuring out a product, the first, we go down this road of thinking technology first and we don't think about, what are your who are your ideal customers and what's what's the organic phrase they're using to complain about their problem? Mm-hmm. So you can look at just basic Twitter searches for I hate data entry or data entry to my CRM. Mm-hmm. You can actually look at these people, who they are, what they do, and create offline relationships with them and actually involve them in the process early on. So you could get a a group of a first concentric circle, I call it, of people that uh, have this problem that you can have personal relationships with them. It could be 30, it could be 50, it could be 100. If you reach, the, talk to them offline and say, I saw you were complaining about this. I'm thinking about solving a problem in and around this. Would you be excited or would you be interested in trying this when it's ready? Mm-hmm. You can create these um, relationships. And the amazing thing about it is when, it, when you're first starting, when you tie those people into that process, they feel a part of it. They start mm-hmm. recruiting other people that are like them. They want to help and go out of their way and be a part of, of something great. So I think when we're in, in the business that we're in, we tend to get into the technology first before we actually find out the organic um, search criteria or what people actually are saying they complain about. You know, I'll, I'll say that eQuire is an interface to your cloud service. There's not one person on Twitter complaining that they don't have an interface for their cloud service. Uh-huh. <laughs> they're, they're, they're complaining that I hate monthly quotas or I hate reporting or I hate data, mm-hmm. data entry or CRM. So we try to engage and create a, um, a, a user group that has a, a meaningful relationship and they'll help you and they'll follow you through to where you're screwing up with the product and say, mm-hmm. you know, I'm not going to go complain about this to my friends because you've set the expectation with me that there's going to be bugs or I'm trying something new. Mm-hmm. I think that's one, one big thing. The other thing I, I try to talk about is um, net promoter scores, I think, is a very valuable um, scale to measure feedback on. It's, it's very, um, there's some, some people that don't agree with it, but for a startup, I think that Figuring out if someone's referring your product or not is mm-hmm. a great way to decide if the product's good enough or it's not. If you're creating more detractors than you are promoters, mm-hmm. there's no reason in the world you should be putting one dollar into marketing. It should be asking them why they're telling why they're telling their friends not to use you. Mm-hmm. So, um, a really creative way to um, measure the pulse of your product and if it's good enough, I think is net promoter score. I talk a lot about uh, retention too. I, I really do think that there's ways to figure out if you've got that metric of retention. And mm-hmm. it gets into marketing once you have those things in place and once you have those feedback loops in place because you want to get someone who's not a prospect to become an eventual evangelist. And a lot of the startup play is about different ways to do that and different ways to gauge where they are in the pipeline. Once you get to an evangelist, I feel like that is the most valuable thing you can create at your company. Mm -hmm. And so our entire sales process in CRM is getting people to that evangelist state because Mm -hmm. they'll talk about your product more than you will (laughs) and they'll get more customers and more qualified traffic than you ever will and it's the highest return on any sort of investment I think. So the the idea is really actually creating as many evangelists as you can because when you have them they turn into five new customers. It's a really amazing thing and there's 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 not much pay that needs to happen when you've got a group of evangelists that always want to talk about you. Yeah, no, so. absolutely. I like the you know the phrase evangelist because like I'm somebody who shares what I think is great in the world. It's just a yes, part sir. of my personality. It's part of who I am. I mean, since our interview yesterday, I've shared eQuire with somebody that I had a conference call with, and I said, hey, you need to go look into this. You probably need to use it, and that I'm going to share it with everybody who needs it from now on because I'm that That's kind right. of person, you know. So I think you're right. That's what you're trying to move people toward. Um, you know, one of the things that stand out in this interview, though, that I want to kind of reiterate for our audience 
is there's two things about you um, that I think people can learn a lot from. One is you're very product centric. You know, you talk to the users before you build a product. You build it based on what they're telling you. Um, you make it something that solves a real pain. Uh, you, you are just very much almost obsessed with the product itself and what it's doing in the world. And the second thing that I, I get from this interview is you have a very long view of what you're doing. It's not about the stats tomorrow necessarily. It's about you know next year, five years. What are we doing to get to the right place? You're not trying to get things up and to the right for an upcoming meeting next week. You're trying to get things up and to the right for a successful, great outcome, you know? And so yeah. is that fair enough? Do you think that's kind of how you see things, product-centric and long view? I, I think it's, that's pretty astute. I would say I, I didn't think of it that, that way, but I think it's spot on. I think um, one, one of my, our favorite advisors is uh, David Barrett. He's the CEO of Expensify. He's just, just one of the, the most generous people with his time and really, really great input. And when we first met David, within five minutes of talking to him, you know, he said, "When you look at, when you talk to these investors, when you talk to people that are looking at your numbers, mm -hmm. this 120 percent spike in a month—that's just a lot of excitement or flash in the pan." Mm -hmm. He said, "If you can get sustainable 10 percent growth for two years, that's real growth. Mm -hmm. That's growth that takes a long time to lose because you're growing." from organic pe people people organically talking about you and it shows a pattern of consistent continual improvement as opposed to some huge spikes from press releases or some new feature that's a lot of flash mm -hmm. not actual organic growth of 10% consistently for 2 3 years mm -hmm. and and when he said that to us it just felt like it was in line with our yeah what we thought was good, what we where we wanted to focus, and it, it wasn't that we were searching for what we wanted to hear, mm -hmm. but we we're that kind of company that grows at that pace from referrals, and we can take feedback that's incremental and and act on it, and not take feedback from ten thousand people and lose most of it. Mm -hmm. you know, the, if you use this in in three months as opposed to today, it's going to be you know five percent better. It's not going to be that we hired 35 engineers and tried to build 100 things. It's that yeah. we're focusing on one thing and making it really good. Um, and we, we do have a three, five-year kind of plan of what we want to do. And we think that that 10% growth is for, for three or five years is actually ends up becoming pretty significant. So Absolutely. And I love that quote from him, you know, just you know, looking for that 10% growth kind of month after month or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, because it almost gives us permission to uh, focus on the right things. You know, it's when we try to compare ourselves to someone else's growth chart and we try mm -hmm. to recreate it. Um, we, we move too fast. You know, I think about it like, uh, you know, you take a pizza dough, right? And, you, you know, you spin it up in the air to kind of, you know, get it mm -hmm. to spread out and become a, an actual pizza. And if you do it too fast, you get holes in it. And that's just yeah. the way it is. Like, you can do it and make it big, but you have to do it slowly sometimes or you ruin the pizza. And I think we do that with startups. We try to stretch the dough and yeah, like look how big it is, but there's holes all over the place and things are broken and it doesn't work and people don't love it. And long term, it's not the right solution. But you do things organically, methodically, long term, and magical things can happen by year two, but not week two. It just, it, it takes more than that and people don't get that sometimes. That's that's really spot on. I think uh, Gabe, Gabe Weinberg from DuckDuckGo is another really great advisor to us and He's he sends out monthly updates on DuckDuckGo since its inception. I think it's on month thirty-seven or something like mm -hmm. that. And all if you look at the traction that he's got, it was just consistent, consistent, consistent improvements. And then out of nowhere, some magical thing happened where the right improvement happened in the right sequence, or it was some new, little new feature focused, mm -hmm. you know, along with some um, enhancements on for performance. And then you saw this spike happen. Mm -hmm. And so I think. You know, ten percent is great, and you're, we're, we're and it's a good thing to have happen. And I think those months where you get the forty percent consistently, I think those are a product of sitting with the product, incrementally improving it, and then all of a sudden, this there's this magic storm where the right people see it, and it's that much better than it was three months ago. And mm -hmm. then they tell their friends, and and then you see that growth. But I think. To your point, it's 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 a great it's a great way to articulate it. It's almost like permission to focus on the right things, focus on the product mm -hmm. and growth that, that that matters. That's from current users telling their friends and figuring out why they're not telling their friends, then fixing that so that they do. Yeah, and it comes back to the, you know it's full circle. It's it's finding yeah. a real pain because if you're finding a real pain. You can play long ball because you know it's a real pain. It's not going away. 
if it's a fake pain, you have to get something to grow quick or you're just like, what's the point? I know I'm not solving a real pain and it's mm-hmm. not growing. So let me move on to the next thing. So you have to start with a real pain and then you can, you know, kind of go that direction. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. Let me ask you uh, one last question here. It's been a great interview. Um, I, I think so much of what you said, people are going to, you know, listen to it. They're going to get actionable advice. They're going to go and, you know, put it into play with their own startup. Um, you've been really transparent with everything you've said today. Uh, so the last piece of advice, kind of high level, um, what's the best advice that you can give to any startup that's trying to acquire or monetize or retain users? Uh, what would you say to that entrepreneur listening to this right now, wanting to understand growth the way you do maybe? Um, I think that it would be something I learned the hard way um, when, when, I, when I first started with with tall and drop card I think I was so excited to just run my own thing or have my own thing and you know have this t- kind of exit where you know I was going to make a lot of money and be you know, really young and be on the cover of whatever entrepreneur magazine <laughs> uh-huh. and when you're younger you can actually muscle through through that um, and and actually you have enough adrenaline to to keep you up to just focus on that idea and mm-hmm. but everything everything breaks when you realize you don't you're not in it for that it, it it you start to think about what actually matters and what you really want to do in a product you want to solve for yourself and only when i think did that we actually start solving a problem that we both knew and both really wanted to see happen and were excited to see mm-hmm. did we see returns starting to happen and do we see improvements in the product so the advice i would give is do something that you really, really want to see happen that you really the, you know intimately about. If you if you know something, um, well, let me let me say it differently. Do something that you love doing mm-hmm. and that you know a lot about because it will it will catch up with you if you're not doing it for those reasons and it will burn you out and it will fry you and it did it did to me. Mm-hmm. And uh, so do something you're passionate about. Dan Dan Martell is another great advisor. And he's a he's a guy who runs Clarity FM, which is you know built around giving entrepreneurs advice. And he said to me on the phone, "The only competitive advantage you have is is the passion that you have for your business because it's it's the only thing that will get you through the really bad times. And there are, there are a lot. If you wake up and don't love what you what you're doing, you're going to lose. And so pick something you really love doing because you're going to be in this for two three years at minimum, mm-hmm. and it should be something you like doing." So that's my advice. No, that's great advice and great advice to end on. Uh, Paul, thank you so much for coming on the show again in some senses. Uh, and again, thank you so much for doing that. I know it's a pain to, to redo an interview, um, but it shows you the kind of person you are. And I really do think that your product reflects those kind of values. You're willing to go the extra mile. So thanks again, Paul. Thank you, Ron. This was awesome. Uh, talk to you soon. Yeah.